function. Whew. Open up your books to 1 John first. Let's go to 1 John. Ah, glory, 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 glory. Make way for the king. <laughs> Y'all got a holy hush in here, huh? Like, ooh. Listen to them wonderful pages. I like to hear the Bible, the pages moving. First John, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but First John. Mm -hmm. Glory be, glory be. I'm going to give you a moment longer. I still have just a few pages. You know, it's good to see it for yourself. I've said it before. It's good to be able to make sure what you're hearing preached is actually coming from the, the Bible, right? It's coming from the Word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word. We've got to have the Word on the inside of us. So, I left all of, all of my notes in the back room back here on purpose. There's two areas that I felt the Lord said that these areas that just need to break them down a little bit. So you're in 1 John chapter 5. Okay, 1 John chapter 5. Whew, man. And then uh, hold that place right there, because that's where we're going to start. There's just two verses I'm going to read in that chapter. But go ahead and open up to Psalms 23, just to have it ready. God's, God is filling, uh, filling us up with fresh revelation and impartation. Um, the Bible talks about in the last days, knowledge shall increase, and it sure is increasing. And the body of Christ is being challenged to come up to a higher level. Now, there's certain things in the scriptures as you go to Psalms 23. There's certain verses that I quote to you uh, over the last couple of maybe a Sunday or a Wednesday. Some of them I actually read to you out of the scriptures. And it almost seems heretical or like heresy or something, you know. And that's something that's very important that you understand. Sometimes when you hear something for the first time, it just don't register. It just don't register. What you, you, You've never quite ever heard it that way before. So it doesn't kind of fit the traditions that you're used to walking in. And the Scripture New Testament says this, that the traditions of men make null and void the power of God. The traditions of who? Men make null and void makes it empty, the power of God. So the power of God is available, but sometimes you can get stuck in a tradition that's blocking the blessing that God's trying to put in your life because it just doesn't seem to fit right with your traditional way of thinking. And so God has graciously, and I'll give him the credit for it, has used me over the years uh, in this house and in many other houses of worship to be a battering ram, to come in and break things off, you know, because prophetic uh, anointing does that sometimes. It just breaks off whatever's trying to hold back the glory and the power of God that is trying to come on that particular house of worship. And so when I say certain things and it just don't fit, put it on the, uh, on the shelf, as we say prophetically, and give it time. It will. It'll start making sense to you. But when you first hear it, it don't make no sense. That doesn't seem to fit in your paradigm. You need to have a paradigm shift. Sometimes you have to, if you're going to grow further, you're going to have to let go further. It means if you're going to go further and you're going to grow further, you're going to have to let go of some things to move into the next place in the spirit realm. And the higher levels that he's calling you, sometimes requires of us to let go of some things so we can embrace other things. So when you hear these scriptures that I'm going to give you, I want you to be able to see that paradigm because he says you got to you got to know that God God has given you your spirit man and he's given you the power to move in faith and get results in your life. 
And uh, so with your spirit, you call things be not as though they were. Come on. That's scriptural. Uh, but with your hands, you gather those things. So what I'm teaching you is um, not the spirit without the body and not the body without the spirit, but how to have spirit, soul, and body function scripturally and get the God kind of results in your life. Because I've always believed that Christianity was a demonstration of power because that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. But that's what Jesus did constantly was demonstrating the power. And he said, he said to them, it's uh, the father within doeth the works, right? So the same God that is in Jesus that was doing the works and the same anointing of the Holy Ghost that is on Jesus is the same Holy Ghost that's on you and in you if you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so God in you wants to do the works. And with faith, we know that all things are possible. All things are possible to him who believes. That's what Jesus said multiple times. So we've got to take these two verses out of 1 John chapter 5, and we got to make sure we put them in our heart and believe them. If you don't put faith to it, faith without works is dead, you got to put some action behind it. And I said uh, uh, last Sunday, I believe, what little bit I remember of last Sunday after the power and the anointing came, um, that when Jesus went, went into Nazareth after he had came out of the wilderness and read out of the book of Isaiah, it said he couldn't do very many wor mighty works there. Uh, he only healed a few sick folks. That's it. And it wasn't because he was not willing. It was because they were with a spirit of familiarity, meaning they had, a, and they said, well, isn't this Jesus? Don't we know where he there? Is it this Joseph, the carpenter's son? Isn't this Mary still with us and her family? So that because of the spirit of familiarity, you can become so familiar with uh, someone you can't receive from them. And that's why it becomes very dangerous. Um, when I say dangerous, it's, it, it's dangerous because once you become so familiar with uh, men and women of God that are in the pulpit, you get to a place that your ears are stopped up and your heart ain't open any longer. You done went off the tracks. You done derailed and you're going in your own direction because uh, you're saying to yourself, I heard this before. I, I understand this or he or she preached this before and not realizing that there's another layer that's in it. That The Bible says that God, Jesus is the Word, right? The Word was with God and the Word was God, right? Isn't that in the book of John, right there in the beginning of the book of John? We're not going to that, that book right now. I'm just saying it before I read these two verses. Is then if, if Jesus and the Word are one and Jesus is the Word that became flesh, are you telling me that you, you can read a chapter of the Bible and because you read it once and you got taught it once, there was nothing left for you to discover in it? No, you've got, to, you've got to have a hungry heart because sometimes there's a revelation that God's been waiting to get over to you, but you weren't ready for it. You weren't ready for it. It's in the New Testament where the apostle came to preach and he come to teach them. And he, he came, the Bible says, to bring meat, to bring some good meat of the word. He came. But when he showed up, he looked at him and this is in Galatians, but he looked at him and he said, y'all ain't ready for it. He says, you just, you're not ready for it. You're like, babes in Christ. You need the milk of the word. You need me to teach you when you ought to be teachers already yourself. So there is a place that you and I have to understand scripturally so we don't become so familiar with the person that we can't receive from them any longer because we don't think we know everything about them and everything about what they know and everything, you know, and therefore we shut them down when God's just about to open them up to give you what you really needed, but you already locked them out when God's banging on the door, open it back up because you wasn't ready for it last year. You wasn't ready for it three years ago, but now you're about ready for it. So don't lock out and shut down through the spirit of familiarity and lose what God's trying to speak into your life. Can I get a witness and an amen? It happens. It happens. And so, therefore, I've always um, I'm not going to go off in the two area, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I, I'm friendly to everybody. But you'll learn, you, you, you guys know me, so I can speak freely. Those that are watching, they'll have their own opinion. I, I'm friendly to everybody, but I'm not friends with nobody. That's you know, uh, that, uh, uh, no. Um, and I know that offended one of my brothers uh, in the faith that moved from Oleander years ago. Um, one of my best friends, and he moved from Oleander Church of God in Fort, Fort Pierce, Florida, and he came up here. And him and his wife, wonderful couple, they helped do children's church, and 
help fill the children's church. <laughs> but uh, wonderful people, love them to this day. They 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 keep in touch. We kind of keep in touch back and forth a little bit. But when they when they when he got here, I said to him, even though he was my best friend, I said, "Here, now here, I'm accountable to God. What I say and what I do in this house, I said I'm accountable to God. So if you're going to come up." in this ministry and be a part of this ministry, you have to understand that this best friends that we have been is going to be a different dynamic. Because when it's all said and done, I got to ask, I got to answer to God when it's all said and done. And the beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord. So I got more fear of the Lord than I do our friendship if it doesn't make it through this fire of what God's going to put us through. Okay. So, and we went through the fire together and things went very, very well. And then he felt led and was called to Colorado and then went on over to Virginia and, and then ended up back in uh, Port St. Lucie, Florida now and, and things like this. So we, we still somewhat keep in touch. They let us know what's going on with all the grown kids and getting married and, and their kids and their grandkids now. But the point being, saints, is if you allow yourself to become so familiar with the service and God tries to tuck something special in the service for you, you'll miss it because you're not even searching for it or looking for it. You got to come hungry. You got to come thirsty if you want to be filled according to the scripture. So you and you can only do that for you. No, no pastor, no man or woman of God can do that for you. That, that's 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 you. You got to do you on creating that hunger and that thirst and be able to pull on the gift grace of the anointing that is on the ones that God puts before you. That's that's between you and the Holy Ghost. That's your portion and saying, Holy Spirit, I want to learn something. I want to drink some living water. I need some fresh manna, and I'm looking for it. You see? And then if you seek, you shall what? You're going to find it. But you got to be seeking in the first place. So here we have in 1 John chapter 5, Verse 14 and 15, just those two verses, 14 and 15. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he does what? He hears us. OK, so we know this about Jesus Christ. Now, if this is the confidence that we have in him, in Christ, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We know God hears us. And verse 15 says, And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Is that in your Bible? That's in your Bible. If you believe it, you could receive it. Now go to Psalms 23, where I will something new uh, to you in this particular area. And I know it's not, it isn't done. The, the Lord is telling me, you, you got to expound on this one particular area of these verses in Psalms 23. You got to learn to quote Psalms 23, and most of you can. So it does start off, so we will read it, but there's a certain portion I'll pull and preach on. Uh, that starts off with, first of all, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall what? Is it scriptural? So if I'm in want, and I, then the other scripture said that I have this confidence if I ask anything and he hears me, if I ask according to his will, I, I believe that if we're looking at Psalms 23, I believe that's his will inspired by the Holy Spirit on David when he penned down these words. The Lord is what? My shepherd, I shall not what? So I'm not going to want. I'm not going to want. There, should, there ought not, all of your needs ought to be met according to his riches and glory. So we understand that as, a, as him being our shepherd, he's going to lead us. He's going to guide us. I think um, this is one of the most important Psalms 23 for a person when they're starting their Christian walk with the Lord to wake up and read every morning and to read every night before they go to bed until they literally can quote it by, by their heart, not just by their head, but by their heart, okay? Where that word has meditated on to the point to them, that's a reality, the Lord, Adonai, the Lord. He is my shepherd and I shall not want. And he makes me to lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside the still waters. Say still waters. Yeah, that's where he wants to lead you, by the still waters. Let me give you an analogy um, uh, it's scriptural, but an analogy is you have Jesus walking in the middle of a storm 
winds and waves and coming down and he's walking on the water like in the picture right here he's walking and the disciples see him and they think they see an apparition or a ghost as they say they think they see a spirit walking and was afraid and then they realized it was the lord and peter he said uh, to the lord if that's you lord uh bid me to, to to come to walk on the water and jesus said come and as soon as uh, peter got out of the boat he walked on the water. He walked on the water. That's very important because saints, I think we're in a water walking time with Jesus in the midst of a storm right now in the season that we're in on planet earth. Maybe not, maybe not our city, maybe not our neighborhood, but in the earth, there's a lot of turmoil that's taken place in the earth. There's a lot of upheaval, if you will, has taken place. You see some of it on the news and some of it, you can't wrap your mind around what's taking place. So as I say, I've been to Haiti at least uh, four times to Port-au-Prince, but I've been to Haiti m multiple times beyond that. And with what's taking place there. If I was there, I better know how to quote Psalms 23. I better, I better know how to quote it and believe it and receive it and not do what Peter did, but do what Peter did start to do is he, he looked at Jesus and Jesus gave him the word and said, come. And he got out the boat. Now, let me tell you, saints, where I'm about to try to take you in a few minutes in the scriptures and, and then the prophetic word behind it, you got to be ready for it because some people don't want you to get out the boat. Because their tradition and religion is as long as in your boat, you're in the boat, you might make it. Now, the storm's raging. And I'm not talking about the time when Jesus was asleep in the boat. I'm talking about the time that Jesus was walking on the water during the storm. And the storms are going to come in life and the storms are going to go. But you put your eyes on Jesus and you stay focused on the Lord. You can walk in the You can walk in the water. You can walk on it. The supernatural. So while everybody the boat that they're afraid to get out of, some of you are going to get this message and you're going to get out the boat and start walking supernaturally in the directions that God's calling you and quit looking at the way it always used to be and the way it was always used to be done. And now it's going to be done in a way it's never been done. And you're looking at, wait a minute, we don't, we don't get Peter. Come on now. We don't get out the boat. Now it, it, it is storming right now. You know better than that. You're a grown man. What you trying to do getting out the boat. Now I know you can swim because you're a fisherman. I know you've been around the water, but Peter, this is ridiculous. You done lost your ever-loving mind thinking you're going to get out this boat. You in your whole life since you was a child all the way up to a grown man, you ain't never walked on no water. You, you either swam or you sank. And that's what's happening in the, in, the, in the prophetic realm. It's not brought to fullness to light yet, but it will be because I can see it. It's going to be brought to light. It's just kind of peering through the darkness, you know, like the Bible says in prophecy, prophetically, you see it darkly, you know, you see it little glimpses of it. It's going to be a time for you to know how to get out the boat. And all of them that want to stay in the boat, you, you don't even have to talk to them. You don't even have to talk. to them. You don't got to spend time trying to explain to them, hey, I'm fixing to try to do something I've never done before. Now, I know none of y'all would ever even attempt this because you didn't even ask him, could you do it? You ain't got time to debate and argue with the naysayers, the people that don't believe the supernatural power of God. You don't have time to wrestle with the flesh of carnality that's sitting in the boat with you. You got to say, no, no, you carnal, you fleshy, you carnally minded. This is the son of God. This is the Messiah. And if the son of the living God who created all that is created says to me, come, I'm going to get out the boat and I'm going to walk on the water. I'm going to walk on it. I'm going to walk on it. I'm going to walk on it. But I got to learn the lesson that Peter had to learn, too. Because he's going to leave me beside some still waters in the midst of the storm. But I also have to learn that once I take my eyes off. And I start focusing on the wind and I start focusing on the wave and I start fo focusing on the rain. Once I take my eyes off. See, this is how faith works. As long as you can keep your faith on him, locked on him, lock, lock into him, all things are possible. 
Christ within you, the hope of glory. You know what I'm saying? All things are possible because you got the water walker on the inside of you. you. You got him in there. God's in you and he does the works. So as long as you got your eyes locked on him and not locked on anything, and I'm talking about anything, the economy, what's going on down the street, what happened in the neighborhood last night, you focus on what's going on everywhere else, you'll take your eyes off him. It doesn't mean we can't be aware of the storms that are surrounding us. We just have to learn how to not allow the storms to affect us in our decision that we can water walk with Jesus. We can get up out of this mess and we can walk through it. As long as we keep our focus, we won't be drowned out by everything that's around us. Can I get a witness? All right, so verse, verse uh, three, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So this is on the earth. I'm telling you, Roy, this is on the earth. For yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. I'm not going to fear no evil. Why? For you're, you're, you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's a place that we got to mature and grow up into. And to realize that though we're walking through even though we're walking through a valley of the shadow of death of things that are decaying and dying around us, we've got to stand up in our spirit realm and say, I'm not going to let go. I'm going to stand and I'm going to be strong, though a thousand fall to my left or 10,000 at my right hand. It shall not come nigh my dwelling. No evil shall befall me. You see, if you don't say it, saints, the enemy comes in to steal, kill and destroy. But when you push back on the enemy and say, not in this house, you don't. You may have messed up somewhere else down the street, but you ain't messing up here because God is not going to allow it because the people of faith ain't going to allow it. And they'll lift a standard against and the shield of faith together as a mighty army. And they'll make sure that the devil knows where you belong is under my feet. You don't walk beside me. You don't come from, from behind me. You know how some people are? The devil been on my heels. The devil been on my heels. Well, if he's on your heels, he ain't on nobody else's because he's not omnipresent. Back in the early days, I had, to, I had to teach some of the traditional old folks the way to think. When I say the old folks, that's anybody that was from 35 and up. Because they had this traditional mindset. Well, the devil been chasing me. They would tell me that in the church, you know, as they was leaving, shaking hands. The devil's been tearing up things in my house. I said, well, if the devil's been in your house, why he ain't been to mine? And they look at me like, what, what, do you, what do you mean? I said, because it can't be in two places at once. Not Satan. Now, he got some demonic forces that'll be messing up in people's houses and lives. But when you're talking about Satan himself, and I would say, listen, you know why he don't mess with me? Not because of my authority, not because I don't know my position of authority. I'm just not that big of a target. I don't think that much of myself. I'm not a Billy Graham. I don't have 30,000 people running to the altar to get saved on a weekend in a stadium. So I just don't think I'm that important. Now, maybe you think you are, so you feels all week long. He's chasing you because you ain't got a soul saved yet, and you're acting like hell, and you ain't even in hell. But yeah, he's chasing you. Why would he chase what he's already got? When he's already got you bound in fear and bound in torment and bound in disgruntled and bound in bitterness. What's he? He don't got no time. He don't have anything left to put on you. You done put it all on yourself. He's like, leave that one alone. I ain't got nothing to put on them. They got enough they put on themselves. He can't because he can't be omnipresent. That's the point. Don't give him more credit. I, 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 that's a disdain. It's wrong. He is not in the class of God and he never will be. He wants to act like he will, but he'll never be in the class of God. He never will be. He's a created being and a fallen one at that. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. Thy rod and your staff, they comfort me. Verse 5. Read verse 5 out loud. All right. Now I'm going to read on, then I'm going to come right back to that. It's only five and six. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup does what? Runs over. 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days. Not some of the days, not occasionally, not when I, I fast for three days and I pray and cry for two days. No, all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, the point that um, God has me bringing out to you in this little season, short season uh, on this is he says he'll prepare a table before you. Right. You prepare. Now, David's under the anointing talking about the Lord, just like it started. The Lord is my shepherd. So he's talking about the Lord. Adonai, the Lord, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So. Here's where here's where I'm trying to get you guys to go. It can it, it can sound like heresy. Um, it can sound like false teaching, all because you're stuck in the boat still. You don't know what it means to get out the boat. Okay, you got to learn how to love God and grow in God, and have um, different uh, titles. Um, you got to know how to wear different titles. Okay. As I said, uh, I think I said this on a Wednesday night, so you, you, you didn't get it on a Sunday, but I said it on a Wednesday. Uh, I, I am, I'm a pastor, yes. I'm a preacher, yes. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a businessman, yes. I'm also a father. I'm also a husband. I'm also an uncle. I'm also a cousin. I'm also a son. At one time, I was a grandson, and at one time, I was a great-great-grandson. OK, it's a lot of different titles, right? Every one of those titles has a different um, different relationship in that responsibility of that title. OK, it has a different relationship. And that's where God's trying to let us awaken to the fact that I'm not what I'm about to preach to you and say to you. I'm not taking nothing away from you. I'm trying to add something to you. See, I'm not trying to take something away from how you have your relationship with God and how you walk with God and how you talk with God. I'm not trying to take that away from you. I'm trying to add something to that relationship that you have with God. Because, yes, you are a son and a daughter of the Most High. That's one area of a relationship. We are a child of the King. We are joint heirs with Jesus and made to sit in heavenly places. I have a different uh, realm of authority. I have a different relationship, if you will. When I come as the son, a son, a child, I'll use that better, a child of God, I got the right through Jesus Christ to boldly come to the throne of God and get some mercy and grace, right? So I can boldly come. Now, when I boldly come to his throne, I'm going to come as a child. You know, because a child like faith, a child like uh, he, he, he's not going to reject the children. Right. I don't care if you are 106 years old. You are still a child to someone who doesn't uh, live in time, but lives in eternity. OK, so I'm going to come as a child on some occasions because I need goodness and mercy to follow me. And I need somebody to help me not look at the storm, but keep my eyes on him. So I'm going to come in childlike faith. And believe and trust in him where I'm weak, he's going to be my strength. Okay? Now, there's another area of relationship that I have with him. And that's when I become as a king and a priest. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible says. He's the king of kings. Now, when I'm approaching the heavenly courts of heaven, and I'm not coming in as the child that needs to be comforted. I'm coming in as a king that needs to have a scepter to take some jurisdiction of some domain and some dominion in the earth. Because once I got born again, it says I'm in the world, but I'm not of this world. Now, my body is, comes from the dust of the earth, and it will return to the dust of the earth. But as for my spirit, it's born again, and I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, right? All right, so my soul he has redeemed. My spirit is alive with the spirit of God. So when I'm talking about walking in kingship anointing, that means I don't walk in brokenness. I don't walk in lack. I don't walk in poverty. Why? Because the king understands what was put on the table. 
And I know how to be the priestly anointing to be a living sacrifice unto God. Means I praise him in the good times and I praise him in the bad times. I don't praise him just because they're good times and I don't praise him as if he created the bad times. I praise him in the midst of all times. Every day is a day to worship the Lord and to magnify the Lord and to glorify God. So these different roles and these different functions that you're learning, I want you to learn at least this part today. I want you to at least learn this part today. Again, it's not heresy. If you look at the scripture, there is a relationship that Jesus has with you where he literally says, I come to serve, not to be served. He said it out of his own mouth. So when I look at this table, here's a couple of things I got to look at. One of them, this table, he prepared it. Say he prepared it. Okay, he prepared it. Let me tell you something. God knows what you like. Jesus knows what your needs are. He knows what you like. He knows the desires of your heart. He knows. But this table that he prepared is in the presence of who? Enemies. And you know as well as I do, because this is Psalms 23, this is not the book of Acts. This is not the marriage supper of the Lamb where you're going to sit around and eat for a thousand years. Come on, somebody. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you're going to do that anyhow. I don't think that's what that's all about. I think we get that mixed up too. We're going we're gonna to buffet for a thousand years. I, I really don't think that's all that's meant to be. Point being though, the marriage supper of the lamb, we know one thing about it. We don't got no enemies there. Okay? And we're already anointed in, in, in glorified bodies when we're up there. And our cup is already running over tremendously up there. So he don't have to make it run over as he does down here. So we, you're not going to need goodness and mercy because you ain't going to steal nothing. You ain't going to break nothing. You're not going to see what I'm saying. So you're not going to need goodness and mercy chasing you and following you around up there. So we got to separate that table. That's not a table we're waiting to die to go sit at. That's a table that he's prepared right here and now because I'm not walking through a valley of the shadow of death up there. That valley's here. So therefore, I've got to understand that this table is a table where he set it, and the person who sets the table is the host. Let me get a drink of water on that one. That, that one will knock you out the boat. Because the body of Christ hasn't, they haven't... It, grab this yet but this is the season to at least start hearing it so if we don't grab it at least the next generation will you know some got stuck in the wilderness because that's all they could do is complain others said we are well capable of taking the land they could have took it 40 years earlier so i know when i'm preaching i'm preaching to different generations and i know that when i'm releasing this word there are people in here that will grab it and hear it and run with it but you got you can't forget i'm preaching to other generations in here and sometimes I'm preaching to the next generation because the one generation just going to stay stuck. They're just going to repeat the past, repeat what they heard, repeat what they used to do. It's just nothing but doing the same thing, going through the same motions, right? So don't, 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 don't take that as being disrespectful. It's just the truth. Some people going to do what they do always. Sometimes you'll walk into a church you ain't been in in 40 years, but they're still singing the same songs. And those that are still living are still sitting in the same seats. Nothing changed. In 40 years. But that's not here. But this fa this, uh, the fact of the matter, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So I have to, as a, pa as a pastor, I have to make sure that I don't preach to the generation that's just waiting to die before they inherit. I'm also teaching them that you are now, now, right now, seeds of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. And so I inherit, and this, there's a lot of scriptures. Boy, I want to get down and walk around. I'm telling you, saints, there's a lot of scripture that tells you right now there's an inheritance for you. And an inheritance you don't work for. And I know this messes people up, and I understand it. But again, remember, I'm not trying to take nothing away from you. I'm trying to do what? Add something to you. I'm not taking nothing away. I believe in hard work. I believe we ought to work hard. I believe you ought to, uh, you know, you'll be blessed by the works of your hands. I don't believe in being lazy. The Bible talks about not being lazy. So I'm not taking nothing away from hard work. 
I'm just trying to add something to you that Jesus, according to the scriptures, he has, because cursed is every man that hangs upon a tree, right? So according to Galatians chapter three, if not chapter six, but I think it's chapter three. But anyhow, nevertheless, Jesus paid the price to break off the curse, right? Well, therefore, when Adam was in the garden, he, now he, didn't, he didn't have to work by the sweat of his brow. God didn't create the garden. And, and then after he created the garden, if you read the scriptures, he creates the garden. He creates the, the seeds full of fish and the birds and the fowls of the air and the cattle and all these stuff. He does all that before Adam comes along. So when Adam shows up, there's already fruit trees. Adam ain't walking around with a bag of seed. God saying, now, you, now, now, son, you got to go plow over there. And then you got to go plow over there. And you got to plant the seed and plant the seed. And then you got to water the crop, water the crop. And then you're going to have to wait. In about six months, you'll get you something to eat. Nothing wrong with that. That's just not how it started. It was after the fall that God on earth is going to bring forth thorns and thistles. It was after the fall that God said, now you're going to work by the sweat of your brow. Right? Nothing wrong with working hard and sweating while you work. That's not my point. I'm not taking nothing from you. I'm just trying to add something to you that there's a lot of wealth transferring going on in the earth. And some people are learning how to do it without the work of their hands or the sweat of their brow. They're learning how to do it from the inside out. They're learning how to call things be not as though they were. They're learning how to walk in the things of the spirit and birth the things of the spirit. Because Jesus said, and greater work shall you do because I have gone unto the Father. Greater work shall you do. Well, greater works, that means that if I got to pay taxes, I might need to go get a fish. Just something to think about. I'm not saying to, I'm just saying something to think about. Why didn't Jesus say, well, go knock on a few doors and borrow? Why didn't Jesus say, well, I got. I got a, he's looking at a sundial and he's, <laughs> I got a big meeting going on tonight. We'll take up an offering at that meeting. Why, why does he do things that's so strange to let us know that we're not supposed to get stuck in this natural realm when we're in the world, but not of the world. And we're supposed to have dominion over the fish and over everything that creeps and crawls and flies. Dominion. Jesus proved it. When he said, go get the fish and open its mouth, the first fish, open its mouth, you'll find the tax money for you and for me. When he said it, it had to manifest. Saints, it had to manifest. It had to come. Didn't have no choice. That fish had to go. The fish, whoo, the creator of life just spoke. And he has dominion over me. Him and for his disciple. Ah, and it went down there and got it. And, it, and, and he didn't have to fish all night. Saints, you're not really hearing what I'm saying. You're hearing, but you're not really hearing. He prepared a table before you. And on that table, there is your tax money for the year. It's already on the table. You just don't realize you need to, by faith, reach up to the table and grab what's already your inheritance because he said, all my needs shall be met and my paycheck ain't enough, but my God is enough to meet the need. He is my Jehovah Jireh. He is my provider. I shall not want or lack for any good thing. So I'm not looking at the job to be the total 100% resource. Is my mic on? Because I still got a yell going on up in here. I even hear my own voice coming back. It is on. I can hear it now that I quit yelling. <laughs> 5,000 people, 5,000 men plus women and children. Little boy got his lunch. Remember that one? How many fish? How, how, many, how many loaves of bread? <laughs> and you got 5,000 men. I... I tell you right now, true, they weren't born again, saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled because Jesus ain't went to the cross. 
if there were five men that knew that that boy had two fish, there'd have been a fight. But Jesus showed you that he was able to take what they had, what little bit they had, and he was able to multiply it to take and feed 5,000 people plus women and children. What am I saying? What's he got on the table that you're leaving? What's he got on the table? You're just trying to fill your belly in your own house, not realizing he wants to give you enough to take care of 5,000 plus the women and the children. See? That's out of the box. That's getting out of the boat. That's good. That's going to a whole nother level. Why? Well, he's the host, right? Well, th th that's part of the relationship that most people won't walk in. They won't allow Jesus like he did with the disciples washing the disciples feet. And he says, well, if you don't let me wash your feet, you'll have no part of me. He's like, w w w wash my head, too. You know, why? not just my feet. Wash my wash everything. What, see, he was grabbing it. And Jesus was trying to tell him, you know, if you don't let me serve you the way that I want to serve you, he girded himself with the towel and washed his feet, the disciples' feet. He said, if you won't let me do this, you're not going to have no part of me. So there's a big part of Jesus you ain't receiving because you, you feel it's not, it's too prideful for you to humble yourself and allow him to serve you. Not realizing that's his heart. He came to die for you because he loved you so much. He wanted to die for you to save you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth upon him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. See, we think about us serving him and that's correct. I'm not taking nothing from you. I'm trying to add something to you. So we don't mind sacrificing uh, unto the Lord sacrifices of praise or worship or working hard, uh, being a living sacrifice, putting praise on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I, I get all that. And we got to fight the good fight of faith. I get all that. I'm just trying to tell you, he really wants to take the church up another notch, another level. But the church keeps wanting to bring Jesus down to their level. No, Jesus, you come down here where we sing the same songs for 50 years. No, Jesus, just stick it. I remember when you moved on this song back in the 1920s. Well, I wasn't born back then. But, and you know, Frank Sinatra was singing it. I don't know. I don't know what was going on in the 1920s. I do know is that I can't live always in used to be anointed and what used to be powerful. I need a fresh anoint my head with oil and I need a fresh cup running over. I don't want, I don't want stale leftover wine. I'm supposed to be a new wine skin. Then the Bible, I'm, not, I'm not talking Bible to you. Saints, there's a whole lot on that table. Now here's an analogy that I used to say, and I'll say this and I'll, and I'll begin to close the message. And, um, and, and, uh, and fortunately y'all are in a church where I actually keep my word on that when I say that. <laughs> Some of you remember where you came from, they said that. And an hour later, they repeated it. And an hour and a half, then they repeated it. And at two o'clock, you were like, did you bring the snacks? Did you bring the snacks? <laughs> no, I believe in feeding you enough that I know that you can digest it and you can go home and work on it and not stretch it so long that you lose the power of what was in the Word. Now, this is what... I, I promise you this is true. This is true. Any one of you, and do not do this. Do not do this. But I promise you it's true. You go home and you fix yourself a nice hot bowl of something and put a spoon beside it. You can get a nice steak, baked potato, and put your fork and knife beside your plate. And you can sit at that table and you can pray. God, feed me. 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 God, I'm hungry. Pick up that fork. Steak getting cold. Butter done melted on the potato. I can smell it. Feed me. Feed me. I don't even smell it no more. Three days later, I can smell it. I don't want it. <laughs> and spiritually speaking, saints, I don't know why the body of Christ can be so ignorant in this area. They do that very thing with God all day long. And God's like, you inherited the promises. According to my word, you are a king. Why are you acting like a pulper? 
My, my children are not seen begging for bread. What you, what you begging for? You don't, you don't recognize who you are, the child of a king. You don't recognize who you are, and you don't recognize that you inherited royalty. You inherited when you was born again and adopted in as his dear sons and daughters in Christ. You were born again. You were adopted in. And therefore, you inherit, according to his riches and glory, you inherit the things that he worked for and paid for and done. Are you hearing me? So that means to tell me when God says, and Jesus said it, God has delivered unto me everything, everything that belongeth to the Father, He has given unto me. And everything that I got, I freely give to you. So we must discover in this season how to get to the table and say, regardless of whether the people in the boat see it or not, that's my debt cancellation portion right there. That's my tax money paid for right there. That's a plate full of healing. That's mine. I'll take that too. See, he's the host. He knows I need my healing. He knows I need my taxes paid for. He knows I need to be. You said debt cancellation. To you came up with that, God. I didn't come up with it. You're the one that said to owe no man alone. Those are your words, not my words. And you said your word can return unto me void, right unto you void. Your word was sent unto me. You don't want me into debt. So therefore, it don't matter how deep in debt I got, you can get me up out of it. It doesn't matter how big I messed up, I, house paid for it. Car paid for. And if you got to start off by reaching up to the table and saying MasterCard, Visa, paid for. American Express, paid for. Discovery, where'd you come from? Paid for. You know what I'm saying? If you got to start right there, if you got to start as if you just started over, at least just start over. And let them work with you from right now going forward that all of your needs are met according to his riches of glory and you shall not want any good thing. Nothing good. And he, it's, and he can do it in 24 hours. You say, well, pastor, you're talking about just, just material stuff and things like that. Well, yeah, but not just that. Ruth said to her mother-in-law, I'm coming with you. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Well, she lost her husband, ended up going with her mother-in-law. You know the story. And Ruth, because it was proper for the rich and the wealthy to leave the corners of the farm of whatever it was, corn, wheat, whatever they were growing, they would leave the corners for the poor. So the poor wouldn't be getting it. That was part of their tithing, if you will, too. But they would leave the corners. And so Ruth shows up. And she starts gleaning the corners. Now she's a widow. And got nobody to really take care of her. And she's trying to take care of her mother-in-law. She's gleaning the corner. And then here come one of the most good-looking men that ever walked the planet one of the richest men that lived in that entire region. Anybody know his name? Boaz. Boaz. Not Bozo. <laughs> Boaz. Uh-huh. Wasn't Bozo. But you say, what are you saying? God will give me a man or give me a wife? Give me... Uh, yeah, he will. Just, just, just don't be messing with Hagar and getting an Ishmael. Wait, wait, just wait, 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 wait. I know it don't look like it'll happen with Sarah, but just wait. Isaac will come along, the promise. The point I'm trying to make, one of the points I'm trying to make is that Ruth did not have to go out there gleaning in the field every day, every week, every month. It's like she showed up, 24 hours later, Boaz shows up. See, some of you are thinking it's going to take a long time, and God's like, you don't get it. I'm about to do it in a 24-hour period. I'm going to take you out of debt overnight. 
I'm going to remove the taxes off of the paper overnight. I'm going to transfer the wealth into your pocket and into your hands overnight. You're thinking it's going to take 50 years, 20 years. God's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to do it in 24 hours. I'm going to take you in 24 hours. I can show you in the Bible where God did it. And the prophet said it. He said, by this time, by this time, tomorrow. And they were in the middle of a famine. And it was exactly as the prophet said. He said, by this time, tomorrow. And they had all the silver, they had the gold, they had the finances, they had the wealth, they had the food, they had the cattle, they had the livestock. Now the God, this, by this time, tomorrow, if you believe his prophets, ye shall do what? I'm trying to tell somebody in this room, by this time, tomorrow, you coming up out of debt, God going to show you a way that you've never seen before. And God's going to give it to you as an inheritance. You didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. He's just going to give it to you as an inheritance. He's going to say, I'm going to bless you 24 hours. By this time tomorrow, debt cancellation, house paid for, car paid for, clothes paid for. Mm, my God, my God, my God. Mm. Now, see, some of you took it, you grabbed it. By this time tomorrow, debt cancellation, wealth transfer, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. Somebody trying to pay off your debt while you're sitting in church today. Somebody taking care of some of your bills and you don't even know it. The end of the month comes, you're going to wonder why it never showed up. You're going to call them and say, hey, paid for, credited too. Glory be to God. How about we take up an offering on that one? Huh. Right up on that message right there. That Did he not say that he will multiply the seed that is sown? 30, 60 or what? A hundredfold. Some of you going to realize because like I've been can't take it with you. So why not go ahead and receive it? Because it pleases God to give you these things. See, I own. Don't own me. Sure you get really own things, but things don't own me. And because I can own a thing and it not have on me, then I'm able to let go of a thing. And it also opens it up where God can say to some of y'all, I want to give you a Bentley. You're like, that's okay, I'll take it. I want to give you a Rolls Royce, favorite color. You're like, now, Pastor, you're preaching way out. No, listen, way out is trying to get your tax out of fish's mouth. Way out is walking on water. God said, I bless you. I put it on you. I'm going to bless you and I'm going to put it on you. And wherever you go, you're going to be a blessing. And, and God, God wants to do it. And he takes pleasure in doing it. And you know what pleases him? He gave you that Rolls Royce and you riding in it. And he, he looks at your heart and he can tell that your heart is not possessed by it. Because he, he can see that if he says, hey, you like that car that I gave you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm enjoying it. I want you to give it away in just a minute. Oh, okay, okay. okay. I know where it came from the first time. See, it, it doesn't own me. Oh, God, why take it away? It's my favorite color. It's my favorite car. It's got everything. Look, look at them rims. Look at them rims. Oh, God, where am I going to get rims like that? Come on. You know I'm preaching right. You know I'm preaching right. This is, oh, oh, oh where, where, wherever you say to give it, Lord, no problem. Because I'm. It doesn't own. it doesn't own me. It's yours. You gave it in the first place. God said, pull it over. See that person right there? Give them the keys. Sign the title over. And it's theirs. You see now, Pastor, how can you be so happy and excited about it? Um, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. 30, 60, or I got to build a bigger garage. See, you don't understand. I understand when God said sow it. There was a and he knew what seed needed to be released and who it needed to be released to. 
so I can look up and see my harvest is right. All right. All right. Let's pray over our, our tithes and our offerings. Glory be to God. I'm so glad you're here this morning. Father, I believe your word, and I'm going to take my faith and extend it, that you give seed to the sower, and you multiply the seed that is sown. And I believe, Father, you got some people in this room, and I know within my spirit and my heart, you really do. You got some people in this room that for them to be a multimillionaire is not going to take them out of their walk with you. They're not going to be staggering away from your word. They're going to just increase the things of your gospel and your word in the earth. You do got some folks you can trust, some people that are ready to inherit what they didn't work for, inherit what they didn't earn, inherit what they didn't deserve, that they're just going to inherit it by your goodness, Jehovah Jireh, our provider. As they sow their seeds, let it multiply quickly. And by this time, tomorrow,